Um, first of all, for uh, anybody who knows me, and I know there are a couple in the audience who do, I apologize for wearing a shirt. My wife made me promise not to look too much like a geek up on stage. So, um, my name's Dave Piggott. I am the tech lead for the uh, Linaro Lava Lab project. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the challenges in deploying uh, test devices uh, from every scale, from very, very low end up to very high end, from uh, IoT all the way up to server class. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Lava itself. Um, uh, how do we, how does it work? How do we deploy our test images? Um, what do we do if a board gets bricked, but when we deploy a test image, uh, the issues surrounding connectivity, um, the physical constraints on deployment. Everything in the Cambridge lab is in racks, and that produces challenges. The, I'm going to talk about the administration, how we manage the devices, manage uh, access to the lab, um, then look at how we test out before we actually deploy new software, new boards, whatever, and then looking at the whole concept of very large-scale deployments going forward. So <clears throat> what is Lava? It's the Linaro automated validation architecture. Uh, the first implementation started late 2010, um, and it's basically just, it, is not, it does not define what tests you run, you can run any test you like. It just allows you to deploy a test image, uh, so a kernel and a root FS, or if it's an IoT device, just the, the Zephyr image or whatever. And then to specify what tests you want to run and run them and gather the results. The first iteration was, um, it was successful, it was good. It had some limitations, and uh, a guy called Neil Williams joined the company back in 2014, and Neil said, we need to completely change this. So the second iteration, V2, <laughs> you can't believe how many meetings we had about what we should call the second iteration, and we came up with V2. Um, that was rolled out fully into the, the Linaro lab, in Cambridge in, uh, well, last year. And we've got com rid completely of the history of V1 and everything. There is a database archive, so we actually do have access to the data if we want it. Um, so, what are the challenges when you're trying to do automated testing? The device, ideally, should boot when you apply power. Because if you have to press a button, that gets a little bit boring, challenging. We, we had conversations going way back about having little robot fingers to press buttons. That's not the way we solve that sort of problem, but um, <clears throat> you're going to have multiple devices connected to one server. Uh, that Lava is a sort of, well, it's not quite federated, but it will be. But it's a um, master-slave uh, environment, so you've got one master which dispatches the jobs to uh, slave servers, dispatchers, in fact, we call them. And if that device, let's say you've got 10 of them connected to one server, you have to be able to uniquely identify that device in several different ways, one of which is... Um, <coughs> If it's a USB serial device, the USB serial needs to be unique so that you can get a unique serial connection. If it's a fast boot type USB device, that has to be uniquely identifiable, the fast boot ID. Um, we use serial concentrators, which allow us to just tell that onto, the, onto a board through the serial concentrator, but not everything has just a standard old uh, uh, RS-232 serial. So, and serial connectivity. You need to have a serial connection to the device so you can interact with it. Lava does everything. Well, okay, there's a caveat to that, but I'll, I'll come back to it. 99% of 
all Lava interaction is through a serial interface. We don't rely on SSH, we don't rely on a network, we just have to have some sort of serial access. And that has to be reliable. That in itself can be challenging, um, but I'll go back to that caveat. With um, IoT devices, you don't have an interaction layer. All you do is you flash an image to it, you then look for the serial output and look for the results and you parse them and um, put them, uh, yeah, but they get collated uh, and put back up. So these are the, these are the things that we have to uh, address with every device. So if the board gets bricked, the first thing we have is power control. We have remote power control. We use uh, software controllable PDUs um, with a PDU control abstraction layer, um, which I wrote. It's a, an SNMP client, which talks to our, uh, our, our PDUs, but there's no reason why you couldn't add support for other PDU types. In fact, it, there was a predecessor to the PDU control that um, gave, uh, basically did everything over a serial connection to the PDUs. Um, written by Matt, I don't know if Matt's here, but um, I shall name check him. The other thing, uh, when you submit a job to Lava with some tests, um, it, it can, the job can fail for a number of interesting, challenging reasons. One of them is an infrastructure problem. If Lava detects that there is a problem with the serial connectivity, with the fast boot flash, with the network, whatever, what happens is we run a known good job with a known good image. We run a health check. And if the board then fails the health check, we take it off out of the pool, take it offline. Um, I mentioned the whole idea of a robot finger to press buttons. What we've ended up doing is actually um, sourcing some Ethernet control relays uh, for emulating the push of a button. So basically, wherever the button is, you just put a wire each side of it, put it out onto the relay, uh, and then you just, uh, there's a, again another abstraction layer. You control the relay, you say, I want that relay to go off for two seconds and then back on, or the other way around, depending on the, the device. So the other thing is, what if, the board, what if the board is completely bricked and even the firmware is not reliable? Well, you can reflash the firmware on some devices, not all. And again, you, some devices just give it you out of the box. Some of them, again, require relay connection to put it into a, a recovery state. And other devices, it's just not possible. So it is completely board dependent and we have to come up with solutions on a per, per board basis. And all of that feeds into the fact that um, we have to do solder mods, which if you're doing, if you're going to deploy as we have around 200 devices uh, in, a, in a lab, it doesn't scale well. Lots and lots of solder mods doesn't scale well. And there's the danger that you might somehow break the board. There's the um, other danger that, well, solder itself can be flaky. And uh, this came up yesterday. There's a thing called the SD Mux has been floating around for about all the time I've been at Lenaro, which is eight years. Um, the idea here is that you have something plugged into an SD slot on, an, on the device and you can write the image onto this from the server and then switch it so that it just looks like an SD card. I don't know how many iterations of this we've had. It started with, uh, in Orlando in 2011, um, I won't men mention the company or the, the name of the guy, who, but he turned up with this thing and it was like, oh, this is brilliant, excellent. We've solved all our problems, except, would work with one board, no others. We had another iteration the next year 
a thing called the um, Lava Multiprobe, multi the LMP, uh, which had an SD MUX. It worked most of the time, and then performance degraded over the period of a couple of hours, not days even. Uh, and we've had other iterations sent to us, uh, contributions. There's, there's another one which has just turned up, I heard about in the last couple of days. M maybe that will help. But that, if we could find the perfect SD MUX, that would solve an awful lot, awful lot of the problems for our sort of low level uh, deployments. But we're not there yet. And it has been a bit of a nightmare. It's been seven years, eight years of trying to get something which works. So the other thing we've learned <laughs> rather uh, painfully over time, uh, and particularly, I want to mention here, a lot of this has come up in the last two years. We've had this deployment f called the LKFT, the Linaro Kernel uh, Functional Test. And it's an isolated in instance of a lava lab in Cambridge. And we had a relatively high failure rate in terms of infrastructure. And those failures were serial, USB connectivity for fast boot, um, networking, you name it. So the first thing, one of the first things we did was go and get really high quality serial cables. Um, I, hate to name check somebody, but FTDI are the ones who uh, we buy FTDI cables, and they are so reliable. Likewise for um, USB connections for um, uh, fast boot and the like, we bought, they're much more expensive, but shielded USB cables. Who knew? We reduced our, our infrastructure error rate when we first started the project was running at around 30%. It is now below 1%. We have a 99% infrastructure reliability, which <laughs> was like a dream when we started this project. And the other thing, um, we had a challenge, which, is, which goes back a long, long way. The USB hubs that we used I have, uh, well, we have spent a lot of money on USB hubs over the years because all the devices need to, be, need to be connected, they need to be available on USB. And we had um, reliability issues. It seemed it didn't matter how, many, how much you spent on the USB hub. After a period of time, the kernel on the server it was connected to would just start to go bleh. I don't, I don't know that there's even anything connected anymore. And the other challenge we had, particularly when the 96 boards project uh, started delivering hardware to us, was that there's only one uh, USB controller on the consumer edition uh, 96 board. So, and there's no ethernet. So we needed USB ethernet, but you also need USB to control the on the go port for flashing to, um, your images. And the only way of doing this, if, if you physically have a board at your desk, that's fine because you just go, oh, I just unplug the OTG and that flips over and enables the other USB ports. You can't do that in an automated environment. And so going back uh, nearly two years, somebody at Arm sent me an email saying, oh, there's this little company make really good USB hubs. And they're here in Cambridge. <laughs> and having bought numerous USB hubs over the years, I thought, yeah, OK, I'm sure this is going to be fantastic. We'll take a look. So um, I contacted this company. They're called Cambryonics. They're up on St. John's Innovation Center in, in Cambridge. Uh, and I asked if we could borrow one to test it out. And uh, yeah, sure, no problem. I said, uh, so they sent it. 
Um, it was coming up to Christmas, and I remember, oh, I'll just unpack it and take a look. And it's a very industrial looking thing. It's got 15 USB ports. The claim on the box is it guarantees 2.1 amps per port maximum load. It comes with a very, very big power supply. And then, I, all I did was I plugged it in to my laptop. And lo and behold, it turned up as a serial device. OK. So I just did a little hackery with a, a Certinet config and uh, telneted onto it. And I got a command line from a USB hub. So I typed, help. <laughs> and it came up with a load of things I could do, one of which was to control the power on that port, on any port. I could control the power on all the ports or just one port at a time. So a little Python later, I had an abstraction layer that allowed us to just say, I want that port on or that port on sorry, in sync mode, or typically we're, we power it off or we put it in sync mode because we need data, not just power. Um, so you put it in sync mode or you put it off. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of other things that that script allows. Um, you can go and find out the state of a port, for example, just so that you, you're very sure of where you are. <coughs> What's more, it's unbelievably reliable. I have never in a year and a half, two years, had any problem with the kernel growing. I don't know anything about any USB devices anymore. Not once. So uh, I then went back to Cambryonics and I said, this is great. I'll buy 10. And he then told me how much they were. <laughs> They're a bit more expensive than most USB hubs. <laughs> but it ha I, I did buy 10, and we now have something like 30 in the lab. Spending ostensibly probably about eight times more than you would on a, 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 a high quality USB hub has been absolutely worth its weight in gold because the reliability. So it is worth, if you are trying to do any sort of large scale deployment, spending that money. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with 30% failure rates, that sort of nonsense. So then there's the physical aspect to how you're going to deploy something. You get a wide range of form factors. Everything, for, so IoT boards can be like that big. And you've got servers, which come in two, un, in one case, three U forms. So anything that's on a, a, a relatively small form factor, we tend to just use monitor shelves. We just put monitor shelves in and then fix them onto the shelf using various techniques. Um, in the cases of boards that come in odd form factors, uh, uh, an example is, um, uh, well, okay, the uh, Versatile Express platform comes in a, a, a box, it's a very nice looking box, but when you're trying to do large scale deployments, it's not great. So what you do is you refactor it into a one new case, which costs you about 40 pounds. Um, and uh, you, you end up being able to deploy many, many more into the equivalent amount of space in Iraq. Um, and one of the things we are doing now, uh, because of our LKFT, we had to look at how can we get more boards, if we've got the, the small form factors, how do we get them into... Uh, Multiply, multiply into one case. And we started doing this manually. I'll come to the future of that in, uh, towards the end of the presentation. But uh, the next problem is we've got a large, we've got actually, there's five, six Lava instances in the lab. Um, 
one for networking, one for um, just general day-to-day -day -day testing, LKFT, Power Management Group have their own. Um, we have the Light, the IoT group have their own instance, and then we've got a couple of staging instances. And you have to manage the configuration of all this, uh, because all those tools I was talking about, the SNMP PDU control, the USB hub control, uh, all of that stuff, you have to get that onto each of the, the uh, dispatchers so that it's available for Lava to use. So all of that server and Lava configuration we hold in a SALT repo. I, I don't know if anybody, everybody is uh, aware of SALT, but it's a very good configuration management tool. Um, it, basically, you, you have one central repository, and then you SALT the changes across all the different uh, dispatches from the, the one master server. Um, we use Ansible for user account management. Uh, I've got the links to the various bits and pieces. You can have a look in, if you look in lavalab.git, you'll see uh, all of those, um, they're in shared lab scripts. There's all the, the stuff that specifically to do all that lovely control and um, uh, monitoring. And the, in Ansible, there's all the user account management specifically as well added to that is uh, VPN access because sometimes people don't just want to submit jobs remotely or using a, a bot or whatever. They want to be able to actually talk to a board and there's a thing called a, a Lava hacking session which allows you to do that. You submit a job as a hacking session, it deploys the image you want, gets the, boot, the, the board powered up and then gives you SSH access as long as you are within the lab network. For that, you need VPN. You can do it with um, remote SSH access into a gateway box, but the principle is still the same. And for people who want to do other types of testing where they, they don't, they may want to do lots of reboots because a hacking session stops the moment the board reboots and you, you're kicked out. If you want to get onto a board and play around with a, a, a lot more, we give you SSH access through VPN onto your control server. And then there's a thing, a, a develop LXC, it's called script, it just runs a container brings the device up, passes all the information through to the container, and you can do what you want then. You can tell that onto the board, you can get, yeah, so you can get serial access, you can flash anything you want onto it, that, you know, anything you want. So th that goes outside of Lava, but it, it allows another layer of interaction. And our power management working group tend to use that quite a lot because they're testing out um, all sorts of weird things that happen during boot as they're doing power measurement. And I mentioned it briefly, staging instances. So we have two staging instances, one for um, the main Lava production and one for specifically for LKFT, the kernel functional test. Um, it's very important because you can't just, there's a new release of Lava every month practically. You can't just install the new release and go, oh, I'm sure everything will be fine, because often it's not. Something fundamental may be broken. So we have at least one instance of every device type in our staging instances. And we, that way we get to test out the new releases of Lava. Also, and this is really important for LKFT, when there's a new firmware available, new bootloader available, you don't just put it on a production instance and just go, I'm sure everything will, will be fine. Again, because it never is. <laughs> it really isn't. We have had so many, oh, no, this, this, this fixes everything. Don't worry. And we've gone, okay, it fixes everything. It has broken everything but the one thing it fixed. So we always, if we get new firmware, we test it out in the staging instance and we test it to destruction, practically. 
because we have to. We, we, we have to provide a service that is high reliability, high availability. And so we, we cannot take those risks. And we, we're risk averse. We have to be. We're providing a service. So I mentioned large-scale deployments where we're looking <coughs> for ways to uh, scale up massively. So we're working with a third party um, to fit 16 of the 96 board CE form factor into one U. And that is more of a challenge than you think because you've got to get all the power in there to power all those boards. You've got to have all the serial and all, all we want is the ability to plug one network cable in, one power cable in, and one USB cable in, and everything else is done within that instance. And we're, we have that, that's actually the last um, design template I got from uh, the third party. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me about that in detail, I can do so outside of the session. Um, if we can do that, 16 boards in one U, we, use, we could have hundreds of boards in one rack. The scalability, the reliability is going to be key in this, but I have great faith in the company doing this, but the scalability is going to be enormous. It's going to be a huge benefit to us going forward because we have requirements where we will need hundreds of a particular board type or even um, mixes of board types because it doesn't have to be just one board type in there as long as they're of the right form factor. It can be, you, you can have a complete mix. Um, that's where we're going. Those are the challenges we faced. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. If, are there any questions? If there are, there's microphones here and here. Yeah, that's on. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey. Uh, is there any particular reason why you used uh, separately Salt and Ansible? I believe you can do, you can use only one of them, right? It's uh, history. All right. Fair <laughs> so uh, the, the originally we used Salt for everything, and that was initiated by um, Andy Doan going back a few years. Uh, and then Ansible became the thing that, that was being used by other areas within Lenaro. So there is a, I have a project to migrate everything to Ansible, but everything is in salt at the moment and works. And it's one of those, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to change. Anyone else? Okay. And thank you very much.